Hey there, grace and peace to you today. I am Captain Roger, currently from the Salvation Army's Corps in Hanford, California, and this is The Shield Online, our weekly worship and study time. I am so glad you have decided to join us today. We're looking at some instructions that Jesus gave to the people following him early in his earthly ministry back in the day. Uh, these weren't just some ideas that he liked or which he thought would make good t-shirt slogans. They are a description of what living in the kingdom of God is like. An explanation of the stages that people seeking to live the way God created them to will go through as they work as his agents in the world. These are directions for us to follow and learn to integrate into our lives. And we have seen so far as we've looked at these that they are, um, well, let, let me put it this way. They are absolutely not the way that things are done. And that was true then, as Jesus preached to people who lived as part of a worldly empire where status and honor were decided by wealth and social standing. And the same is true now, a time when we gauge a person's worldly value using exactly those same criteria. Jesus brings it home to us that God doesn't care one whit about the cash we flash or the clicks we get. The Lord built people to live and love and grow together in community, and anything that erodes that community should just not be done. As we have gone through these, one at a time, I have tried to make sure that each lesson we are learning stands on its own. But that's not really how the Beatitudes work. They definitely build on top of one another, and today's is really the very top of the pile. There is one more blessing we're going to talk about after this one, but it's kind of stepping back and giving us a big picture view of all that came before, whereas today's blessing is one that really calls us to lean on all of God's promises as we put it into action. All right, you say, I'll bite. Which beatitude is this again? Aha, we are in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 10, Matthew 5, 10. And today, as uh, uh, most days, I am using the New International Version 2011 edition for my translation that I'm going to read from. If you have a different translation, your words may be different, but the meaning behind them should still be the same. I use the NIV because I don't have to nitpick it as often as I do some of the others. Every translation requires nitpicking because, quite frankly, just by the nature of what it is, translation is... Um, uh, it's a lie. <laughs> it's a, But we'll get into that another time. Today we're in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 10, and hopefully I've given you time to find that in your Bible so you could follow along. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, give me just like three minutes to word geek on you so that I can be sure we're all reading this the same way. To be blessed, as we've talked about before, is to be living in sync with the way of God. It's not a bonus check or an extra helping of whipped cream on your Sunday. Those things are nice, and sometimes people do try to swap the word happy in for the word blessed, but the original word from the original language is about an objective thing that's happening. Us living the way God created us to live. To be in sync with God's plan. Persecution, that's a new word for us. Its original word means more or less what we've come to expect from the English word, to pursue someone to cause them to suffer. That could mean hunting them down to kill them, or it could mean snapping back with that sick burn that leaves them emotionally or socially wrecked. It's about causing harm or pain. To be the one getting persecuted means someone is causing you some kind of suffering. Righteousness. We've talked in depth a couple of times about righteousness. It means to be seeking to establish or maintain a right relationship, like the one that God makes available to each one of us. It's about building up, not tearing down. And the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, anytime we see that phrase, that's Jesus' shorthand for living out God's original intent for the world, including us being in right relationships with the Lord, with one another, and with the world around us. Jesus told us that the kingdom of God was at hand and that it's up to us to live as citizens in allegiance to that kingdom rather than holding to the rebellious ways of the world. Which is a whole lot to hang on to this one little saying in Matthew 5.10, isn't it? In sync with God are those who accept suffering is a potential consequence of seeking to live in right relationship the way God created us to. Yeah. So that's crazy, you might say. Why would you want to do that? Well, 
I mean, if you think about it, if we're doing good and someone else is working against that, why don't we just take them out? Just take them out, then they won't be a problem anymore. Terrorists attack to show that they will cause you harm if you don't do what they want you to do. And in recent weeks, we have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of strikes launched by terrorists. Missiles, drones, people taking shots at people they deem to be enemies, people taking prisoner and hurting or killing those who are in the circle that they have declared worthy of violence. And then statements get issued, oh, we have killed this person because of these things that we deem to be unacceptable to our way of life. And if anyone dares rise up and try to take their place, we will do it again. And the people doing that, they're terrorists, right? So those on the other side, they can't let that stand. And in response, they gather their forces publicly and in secret, and then they lash back. They fire missiles. They launch drone strikes. They arm people to take shots at those they have deemed to be enemies. They take prisoner and hurt or kill those who are in that circle they have declared worthy of violence. But then that first group is outraged. Well, the people who are doing that to us must be terrorists, right? So they vow to respond as they have promised they would, and back and forth it goes. Every side in a conflict has the same goal, peace. And their path to that goal is always the same as well. Peace by causing our enemies harm until they're too afraid to live anyway except the way we say they can. Peace by eliminating all other viewpoints. Peace by shutting them down, by shutting them out, by leaving no one but us here. Or maybe just by hurting them enough so that we can know they understand how hurt we feel. Yeah, well, but maybe they feel the pain of their loss differently, so then they need to cause more of a different hurt to us so that we can know and understand how they feel. Strip away the patriotic fervor and the flags and the uniforms and the insulting adjectives we deploy against one another, and there are just a whole bunch of hurt people who are trying to hurt people. But citizens of the kingdom of God are supposed to be focused on following God's way, not our hurt. We're supposed to be mourning our wounds, not inflicting the same damage to others. We are to approach the world with humility and gentleness, not arrogance and superior firepower. To crave a relationship with others, to grant mercy instead of demanding retribution, to seek what is best for others. These are all the things that we are supposed to be doing to help us all find healing and wholeness, not just some absence of conflict by destroying everyone who's against us. See how every piece of the Beatitudes builds on the ones that came before it? And Jesus tells us that being in sync with God may demand that we keep our hurt in check so that we can build a relationship with that other person instead of creating more harm. And trying to bring this home to the people who had followed him up a Galilean hillside to learn how they could become citizens of the kingdom of God, Jesus said, and this is a few verses farther down, Matthew 5, verses 38 to 39, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, now, very important, do not. Do not misread this. Do not. It, let me tell you what it absolutely does not say. It does not say that we lay down and let people do whatever they want. It does not say that we stay in an abusive relationship. It does not say that we watch someone being oppressed or assaulted and just shrug our shoulders and say, well, I guess I can't do anything about that. Uh-uh. I've heard people try to claim that as part of their justifying their desires to lash back or to return hurt for hurt or to avoid getting involved at all. And that is not it. Instead, what's going on here, there is a point being made about seizing an opportunity to show love for God by showing love for others. Allow me to explain. In much of the ancient world, there was some form of the whole eye for an eye rule. And in most societies, including the ancient Jewish rule set up by the covenant of Moses, it was a, an ultimate limit. It was the absolute limit. Uh, if someone took your eye, the limit of legal recompense was to be one eye. And I say it that way because it was a debt that was usually settled through payment or labor, not by poking out someone's eye. But if the person causing the loss was of higher status than the person who lost that eye or whatever, a lot of times that penalty would be less, often much less. 
Now, here's something most people don't realize about God's covenant. If it was followed, the community it set up and led was completely classless. There were no social levels. There were no castes. Every person, their life, and their eyeballs were worth exactly the same as everyone else's. And rules like this were written to protect the honor of a person or a family. Their loss could be vindicated by repayment. That's why you could pay the penalty instead of losing your own eye. Another maiming would lead to bad feeling and more blindness in the community. Paying the value ascribed to the eye balanced the scales without further loss. <clears throat> the idea of not returning violence for violence or evil for evil this idea was actually really widely taught. It wasn't just Jewish philosophers who were spouting this off. It was also the Romans and the Greeks before them, believe it or not. Vengeance, after all, vengeance is never about just returning hurt for hurt. The act itself causes greater harm by tearing apart communities. Jewish scriptures and sages said that vengeance needs to be left to God. Socrates said that one should never do evil and therefore warned against returning evil for evil. And when Jesus says not to resist an evil person, that's not a great translation. A more literal translation can read that he says not to respond violently to a violent person. Or perhaps it could be translated as don't strike back at evil or one who has done you evil in kind. All right. Jesus was and is completely in favor of resisting evil. It was at the center of everything that he did. But the means he advocates aren't the fight or flight methods of violent opposition or complete passivity. Instead, he calls people to what Walter Wink referred to as militant nonviolence. The Reverend Dr. Wink is also known for pointing out to his students that Jesus abhors both passivity and violence as responses to evil. Now, in the first century, you could insult or dishonor someone by slapping them with your right hand. This was something done to put someone in their place, because if you struck a peer that way, it would incur a sizable fine. To strike a peer with your fist, that ah, was going to cost you a shekel. To backhand them as if they were an inferior, that would cost you a hundred shekels. That's three and a half months salary. That backhanded slap, that was how you admonished an inferior. Masters could backhand their slaves, parents could backhand their children, and Romans were allowed to backhand Jews. If a Roman soldier were to backhand a Jewish peasant, retaliating would be suicide. The normal response to this kind of offense is to cower and submit to the attacker. So what would Jesus' advice to turn the other cheek accomplish? Well, it sounds weird in our culture, but in theirs, it says something to the effect of, try again. You have failed to demean or humiliate me. I am every bit your equal. And how can the one striking respond to that? If you've turned the other side of your face. They can't backhand you again because your nose is in the way and your left cheek really can't be hit at the angle that you're leaving them. And, and they can't hit you with a fist because that acknowledges you as an equal, which is the opposite of what the, the original slap was supposed to convey. And they can't hit you left-handed because your left hand was only used for unclean actions. And that would convey a message that your assault is something unclean. So if you're that soldier, you're going to be uh, confused. What do you do? I mean, you're all flustered. You could order that peasant to be flogged, but they've already made their point. They've shown you that they're a human person with dignity and worth. And you don't own them and you can't control them. And they do not submit to your rule. You're just beating them if you have them flogged for that. Turning the other cheek isn't cowering or giving in. It is actually an act of defiance. Look at verse 40. Jesus goes on. He says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Or your outer garment, in this case, it's translated as your shirt. Uh, your outer garment was generally used as collateral for a loan. Uh, according to Deuteronomy 24, if you took that pledge of a, a cloak or outer garment from someone who was poor, you needed to give it back at sundown each night so they would be able to stay warm as they sleep. 
Someone being poor enough to be taken to court for the claimant to get whatever assets they have left was a pretty common scenario in, in Jesus' day. They would be stripped of their lands, their goods, and even the last thing they had of value, their robe, their outer garment. And Jesus says, look, once they've taken all that, you should give them your shorts too. In those days, the shame of seeing someone standing around in the all together was on the person who saw or caused that nakedness. So this is a way to push back, uh, declaring the creditor to be someone who would rather see someone destitute and naked than give up a penny of their own wealth. Wink says, in effect, Jesus is sponsoring clowning. He's using the absurd to point out injustice rather than allowing it to just happen quietly. And this brings up one of my favorite Talmudic sayings that illustrates the very same point. If your neighbor calls you an ass, put a saddle on your back. I love that. <laughs> uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, he was walking up a narrow sidewalk in South Africa one day, and he encountered a large white man who apparently didn't want to share space with a black man. Get off the sidewalk, the man barked. I don't make way for gorillas. So the bishop stepped off the sidewalk and made a sweeping gesture towards the way the man was traveling. He said, huh, I do. Rather than giving in to injustice or responding with violence, Jesus encourages his followers to find a creative response. Which brings us to this interesting picture that he presents. Look at verse 41. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. The Romans gave sweeping rights to their soldiers to keep subject populations in check. Soldiers could enter your home and demand a place to sleep. They could tell you to make them a meal or pack them some food. And they could stop any person at any time and make them carry the heavy pack of armor and gear each legionnaire had with them for a full Roman mile. The oppressed people of subject nations were treated as inferior. They were laborers. They were slaves and pack animals. Nothing more. The loss of the time and the work that they had to do meant nothing. They just had to carry that guy's gear. And so Jesus tells them, eh, don't stop. Keep going. Carry that burden for that soldier twice as far as they could force you to. Craig Keener says that going the extra mile is not only a case of submitting to unjust demands, but also of exceeding them. It's showing love to one's oppressor, although one's associates may wrongly view this love as collaboration with the enemy occupation. It's bending over backwards to show that one loves and takes no offense. Think of this another way. What if that soldier came to your home demanding a meal and you treated him as an honored guest instead of an enemy? As if he was family or a beloved friend instead of allowing yourself to be demeaned or thinking of the experience of feeding that soldier as oppression. What if you thought of it as an opportunity? The next thing Jesus says is, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Again, what he's doing, he's counseling his followers to hold their belongings loosely. Anything we have ultimately belongs to God and we are to trust in his provision, right? Trust in his provision. Sorry, I got lights going across my face, huh? That's a whole different sermon, trusting in God. But think about how that fits here. Isn't most of the violence that we see and share in our world related to people who are demanding more for themselves. If we lived simply, keeping only what is enough, would that be terrible or would it be a blessing? What more would we be able to use to show others that they're worthy of care regardless of how they're trying to treat us? If you remember that the headings that publishers put into our Bibles are not part of the original text. You'll realize that Jesus didn't stop at this verse. Most Bibles have that heading right there that makes you go, okay, I should stop. But you know what? Don't stop. Keep reading. He goes right from talking about how to respond to others to this. Verse 43, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you might be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
being part of the kingdom of God, being part of following the way of Jesus means our goal needs to be more than responding to our enemies by not fighting them or killing them. We should love them and pray for them even when they treat us in ways other than we would like them to. God sends the greatest blessings of life, the sun and the rain, two components we all need to live. He sends those on everyone. It doesn't matter if they're evil. It doesn't matter if they aren't working to build a healing, supporting relationship with us. God still gives them his best. And this is what we are called to do. Well, why? Why would we put time and energy into caring for those who don't care for us? Mm, keep going. Verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing any more than others? Don't even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We give our best because God always gives his best. We need to love others because God loves them. The perpetrator wants you to be a victim. As a citizen of the kingdom of God, no human being can make you do that. Your value does not come from their opinion. It comes from God. Your security doesn't come from your ability to strike at them. It comes from God. Your ability to live a comfortable life doesn't come from wealth. It comes from God. Everything that you value, everything that you hope for, everything that will give you joy and fulfillment and peace comes from God. Not everyone will treat you as the beloved child of God that you are, but you can still choose to act as an agent of the kingdom by turning the other cheek. Practice loving people in every situation as if you were God allowing the sun to rise and shine in their lives. To borrow a line from the Bible project, when we choose to resist evil through acts of love instead of perpetuating cycles of harm, we become signposts to the new creation where justice and peace reign. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Remember that violence cannot create justice or build relationships. Choose to live out righteousness rather than dwelling on vengeance because a place in the kingdom of heaven is reserved for you. And hopefully, if they accept it, there is a place reserved for those enemies as well. Hmm. Amen. Hey, whoever you are, Wherever you are, whatever circumstance or situation you think you've gotten yourself into, remember, you have nothing to fear. God is with you. Just turn and go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you in the coming week. We'll see you next time.